78 Highlanders will fire a volley. At 700, ready. On the range last week. We shot to 800. What's your problem? Well, I was hoping that he'd wait till they get a little closer for some, you know, good independent stuff, you know. Well, judging by the way they're running, you're gonna get your chance, so just tank tough. Present! By God, those buggers are moving fast! 200! Independent firing! Wow, they're, they're moving fast. Come on! That was really kind of them. It's important to realize that by the time of the issue of the Martini Henry, beginning in 1874, the Army had only been equipped with a general issue rifle for some 20 years. Great strides had been made, learning from experiences of the Crimea, the Indian Mutiny, and the wars and actions of the 1860s and early 1870s. Added to this was a body of knowledge gained from the observation of foreign wars, such as that fought between France and Prussia in 1870. The army of the mid-1870s was about to make significant changes in doctrine, and, as we shall see, the program of musketry training, though initially well-rooted in the practices of the previous 20 years, would grow in complexity and scope, so that by the early 1890s and the advent of the magazine rifle, army shooting would become much more practical in nature. In this video, we'll introduce the topic with a bit of background and history, some information related to targetry and ranges, a brief review of the ammunition, and the orders of dress used during musketry training. The references used in the production of this series are a number of musketry regulations from across the era of the Martini Henry, the 1874, 79, 84, and the 87, which was reprinted with amendments in 89. The Martini is perhaps the most iconic weapon of empire, and it saw service all over the globe. Many famous actions were fought with this rifle. The Battles of the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, the First Boer War of 1880, the Second Afghan War of 1879-80, the Anglo-Egyptian War of 1882, and the many and prolonged campaigns in the Sudan during the mid-1880s. While the details of these campaigns and actions are perhaps outside the scope of this video, they serve as a backdrop to the details of the training that the men who fought in these theatres would have undertaken. In doing this, we can better understand the capabilities of weapon and soldier when we place them, in our mind's eye, at the foot of Islandwana, or behind the mealy bags at Works Drift, storming the heights above Kandahar City, or standing in the square at Abu Klei. The fighting doctrine of the infantry changed remarkably in the 15 years the Martini was the frontline weapon. While the army had been armed with breech loaders in the form of the Snyder issued from 1867 onwards, the realities of a breech loading battlefield were only just being absorbed. With the stunning Prussian victory over France in 1871, there was a tactical conundrum that needed to be fixed. For maneuver in tight formations in the face of breech loading weapons had proven to be so very costly. By 1877, the army had made its first major change to its infantry doctrine enshrining extended order rather than close order as the primary fighting tactic. This in turn would drive a different paradigm on the battlefield. And resultantly, by the 1880s, the system of army musketry training would begin to follow a more practical outlook. When examining the system of musketry training, it's first important to understand the fire tactics of the era, as it was these which drove the construct of the various shooting practices prescribed to the men of the infantry. Individual fire was the term used to describe the engagement of a target by one man, acting alone. In a tactical sense, perhaps a single designated soldier, or a man on sentry engaging an enemy by himself. On the range, this was represented by a series of practices where the man fired by himself at a single target for score. 
Collective fire was the term used to describe the vast majority of engagements and encompassed by the 1870s and 80s a great many variations. Firstly, there were two types of collective fire, namely volley and independent fire. Superimposed upon these variations, different formations could be adopted depending on the tactical reality. As we shall see, this type of firing was also practiced on the range, collectively in small groups, and ranging in size from about 10 to 20 men at a time. Close order saw the men in what many may identify as the classic formation of two ranks standing shoulder to shoulder. Used as a basis for further maneuver and also for certain tactical situations where maximum fire density was required, it was by the late 1870s not the default fighting formation as it had been in the past. Extended order long used for skirmishing and other so-called light infantry duties, saw the files or pairs of men, one front rank and one rear rank, move so that they were farther apart. This covered much more frontage, lessened the density of any firing line, and allowed for better use of the ground by the men. By the late 1870s, the tactical minutia of the drill book saw this become in effect a single rank when actually firing, known as rank entire. So, for any practical assessment of any fighting formation, this single rank formation must be seen as the default for use when actually firing. This extended order, or rank and tire as mentioned, was the way in which the British infantry were to fight for the majority of the Martini era. It's important to realize that the army, like any army, must have at the very core of its doctrine its attention firmly focused on fighting a like armed enemy. The term used today might be near peer or peer. While understanding that the doctrine as mentioned thus far was developed with this in mind, we must acknowledge, but also place in the correct context, the use of what were by the 1870s and 80s somewhat old fashioned or even traditional tactics, as the case may be, as the army found itself facing many and varied enemies as it campaigned around the globe. Here, fighting in close order sometimes even accounting for all-round defense in the form of a brigade or even army square, became tactical options due to enemy weapons and tactics as well as the specifics of the ground at hand. So, while a great many instances of close order fighting were to be seen, it's important to keep in mind that the army was trained, in effect, in many different tactics that were used as the situation demanded. So, in effect, there were a number of options that could be exercised by commanders. Volleys or independent firing, in either close or extended order. All dependent on the ground, the enemy, and other tactical considerations. As we shall see, it was this tactical reality that drove a great many aspects of musketry training. Indeed, as tactical considerations developed over the decades, more attention was paid to what might be termed more realistic aspects of musketry training. In 1874, at the beginning of our story, each man received 90 rounds, used in individual practice, volley firing, independent firing, and a skirmishing practice, which involved movement up and down the range. By 1887, this total was raised to 200 rounds, as well as with the addition of a small reserve of 1,200 rounds for every battalion to conduct test and experimental firing. By this later date, the standard evolutions of individual practice were augmented by further individual practice as well as by a myriad of collective field practices. These included fixed sight point blank shooting, rapid shooting, shoots at disappearing targets, shoots at moving targets. In addition, a section level field firing attack evolution numbering some 20 men in extended order, covering some 600 yards with movement coordinated with fire. This topic has proven to be quite complex as this description entails, and I'll do my best to track the progress and evolution of musketry training as we progress through the 1870s and 80s. This evolution represented quite a shift in tactical doctrine and the musketry to support it. The entity that was responsible for developing and propagating the evolving aspects and techniques of army musketry was the School of Musketry at Hythe. Here was the brain trust of the military shooting world, and the torch of any innovation or refinement was kept here. 
it wasn't just the development of training programs, but also the training of regimental instructors of musketry who would return to their units as subject matter experts. These men would be the vehicles of maintaining standards and driving change across the army. While not the premise of this video, the period in mention covered the issue of a number of different marks of Martini Henry. The Mark I was issued initially from 1874 and was the service's first purpose-built breechloader, replacing the Snyder Enfield. The Mark I suffered from some mechanical deficiencies, in particular a somewhat complex trigger linkage that could get fouled and result in very unstable trigger pressures. This was fixed with new parts in an upgraded Mark I-2. Newly manufactured Mark IIs were made from 1876. The Mark III Martini was used primarily by reserve forces in Great Britain, as well as by colonial and Dominion armies. The Mark IV Martini Henry came as a result of the failed .402 Enfield Martini program. While not the preserve of this video, the rifle was used by volunteers in the United Kingdom, as well as by the Indian Army. Apart from the weapons and the skill of the men using them, one other fundamental aspect of musketry was the targetry. Army targetry went through a series of changes over the 15 or so years of the Martini era. For ease of presentation, I've broken it down into two categories of my own designation. The first type was what I have called class targetry. This was the targetry used for individual shooting, broken into three classes or ranges, and was built upon a target system that had been established in the 1840s and 50s. At its core was a cast iron slab measuring two feet by six feet and marked with a six inch grid. These could be joined together to form larger targets using the cleats along the edge. They were placed on a solid platform and normally propped up with a series of stays. At times throughout the era, these were also marked with various shapes necessary to paint the various sized rings required for scoring. The other category of targets could be termed the collective and field firing targets. These could be made of the aforementioned cast targets placed in larger groups or alternately as individual targets for certain evolutions, and in addition there were types of field firing targets made of wood or canvas used to represent dug in or concealed enemy. Without getting too pedantic, perhaps an outline of the targetry is used from 1874 through 1887. The 1874 regulation continued the use of the square-based scoring system, as had been introduced in the 1860s, and would feature the standard arrangement of target combinations for each of the range classes. The third class target, for use up to 300 yards, consisted of two targets, giving an overall dimension of 6 feet high by 4 feet wide. The second class, for use at ranges from 400 to 600 yards, was made of three targets, giving a total dimension of 6 by 6 foot. The first class target for ranges over 700 yards consisted of four targets and a total dimension of six foot high by eight feet across. For the collective evolutions of volley firing and independent firing, a larger series of targets was joined together, numbering six at this time, across which was painted a two foot black line. The more dynamic practice of the era, the skirmishing practice, which was shot between 400 and 200 yards had the targets separated by six paces, each with their 24-inch aiming mark painted across the center. In 1879, the targetry changed in detail, though not in general. There was a return to circular bullseyes and centers, as had been the case in the 1850s. The classes and general dimensions remained the same, however. The volley and independent firing target received a thinner aiming mark, although it maintained its original 6 by 12 outer dimension. For the skirmishing practice, the single targets were now laid on their sides, presumably to better simulate lying or concealed enemy, though they maintained their 24-inch aiming mark. Contained in the 1879 regulation were the first examples of field firing targets, initially simple balloon-shaped likenesses of a head target and simple systems of screens to represent scaled versions of formations of men at greater distances. These were used in live fire tactical schemes to practice attack and defense evolutions with live ammunition, away from the conventional range if possible. The 1884 manual maintained the class targetry system, 
although shrinking the bullseye of the third class target for use at 150 yards to 6 inches rather than the normal 12 inches used out to 300. The volley and independent firing target was maintained at its 6 target or 12 foot width, although for ranges over 400 yards, two more were added for a total width of 16 feet. The 1884 manual saw a much more comprehensive series of both individual and collective practices. To practice the men at shooting at smaller targets, a single target was placed sideways, painted with two head and shoulder shapes. A new introduction to the targetry was the full-length figure, painted on a single target. This was used for an individual point-blank practice, used with fixed sights, as well as for the aforementioned skirmishing practices, done from 400 to 200 yards, with the targets placed six paces apart. Also new to the 84 manual were the disappearing targets, where a series of head and shoulders targets were rotated about an axle, alternating their exposure. As well, a moving target that would cross between two points on a covered track was introduced. Now it stands to reason that these rather complicated arrangements weren't available on every range facility. Certainly they were at some of the larger ones. A style of field firing target was also formalized, better representing a head and shoulders, and could be stuck into the ground with its two iron pegs. 1887 saw perhaps the biggest change in targetry of the era. Here the system of bullseye-based class targetry was dispensed with, and the full figures were painted on the targets. The scoring rings were still there, and used for points, although they were invisible at distance, and the men would have to learn to shoot at specific parts of the figure in order to score with the highest probability. Not perhaps the best execution of the idea, but interesting nonetheless in its concept of the use of the figure for shooting rather than the bullseye. For recruits, the third class target was marked with a white bullseye. The volley and independent firing targets kept their range-based dimensions of 12 foot and 16 foot. Used at ranges up to and over 400 respectively, but now, instead of a simple black aiming mark painted across the width, each individual target would have the full-length figure painted on it, perhaps better representing a rank of men in close order. These, of course, could be used in field firing applications as well. This era also saw the use of the new third-class target being used in a defensive practice, where a fixed sight was used to simulate the advance of an enemy in the open. In addition, a head and shoulders version was used for an individual attack practice to simulate a dug-in or concealed enemy. Skirmishing targets remained as they had been, with single targets spaced out at intervals. Interestingly, a combination of upright figures and sideways head and shoulders figures were used for a section level, about 20 men, attack practice. This was shot at ranges diminishing from 600 yards. As mentioned, the epicenter of army musketry was the school at Hythe. There, many ranges had been constructed along the Shingle Beach, and these were used to train the students at the school as well as any army units stationed in the south of England. There were, of course, ranges all over the empire, in far-flung garrisons from India to Canada, and thus the musketry doctrine developed at Hythe was propagated across the empire. There were, of course, smaller ranges all over the UK, with many having been constructed during the 1860s in the flurry of musketry activity that came along as the volunteer movement gained popularity during that decade. Perhaps the most comprehensive of these were the ranges on Wimbledon Common. Now known for its tennis more than anything, until the advent of the 303 magazine rifle in the early 1890s, Wimbledon was the Bisley of its era. In fact, the facilities from the former were replicated at the latter, with the move made to accommodate the greater safety margins. Whether large, national-level facilities or smaller, local ranges, all had similar features. Typically sighted against some sort of rising ground, or out to sea, or with simply a large area behind to allow for accidental overshoots, the targets were placed on a platform in front of a large berm or bullet trap, many feet high. If there was some danger of people being behind this arrangement, then typically flags would be flown to indicate that the butts were in use. The butts could be used for singular targets, as in the case of smaller facilities, or large multi-target arrangements. 
By the 1880s, the marking and scoring of targets was done from a trench, dug immediately before the target, in which a man stood, protected from accidental stray rounds and from bullet fragments by a thick piece of glass set into his trench. From there, he could witness the strike of the bullet and signal the hits using a marking disc, either on the target itself or on a corresponding dummy target. But more on that later. Earlier in the era, a simpler arrangement of a mantlet was used to shelter the target marker. Constructed of iron or reinforced earth, it was placed off to the flank of the line of fire, and the marker observed the bullet strike from within. He then signaled with a system of flags, or using a dummy target, the hits that he saw on target. It must have been some heady days standing so close to an iron target being splattered by flying lead. These earlier style marking arrangements were still in use on older or less supported range establishments. Stretching back from the target area, the range was marked and perhaps landscaped at 100 yard intervals. Here, the various groups of men would assemble to shoot their practices at the designated ranges, delivering their fire either singly or in groups, depending on the practice. Observing the signals from the butts, the scores were also tallied in the register held at the firing point. As we can see here, the arrangement of firing points, targets, and butts, as well as the accompanying safety arrangements, were well established by the 1870s and 80s. There is still evidence of these old disused ranges all over the UK. Reminders of a bygone but shooting crazed era. The marking of targets was accomplished with two methods. An earlier method, though still in use at the time of the Martini, was by the use of flags. A series of colored flags, white or yellow for an outer, dark blue for a center, red and white for a bull, and a red for a ricochet and or danger, were used held at various positions above the mantlet or trench to indicate the position of the hit on the target. Thus, an outer hitting at 11 o'clock was indicated by the white flag held high to the left. A center hitting at 3 o'clock was indicated by the dark blue flag held at an intermediate point to the right. A bull hitting at 2 o'clock was indicated by the red and white flag held high to the right. In the case of a ricochet, conspicuous by its oblong shape as it hit the target, was indicated by the red flag waved back and forth above the mantlet. In the case of a miss, there was no indication. The use of flags seems to have fallen by the wayside as the era progressed, and dummy targets were used from above ground mantlets along with marking discs. In situations or facilities where marker trenches were in use, the actual targets were used and the marking discs placed directly upon them. Here we show the use of the dummy target. Note the reversed colors to avoid confusion. In the case of a bull, at 10 o'clock, the black disc was used to indicate the hit. In the case of a center, at 4 o'clock, the white disc was used. And in the case of an outer at 11 o'clock, the white disc was first held off to the side of the dummy target and then moved directly to the position of the hit. Ricochets were signaled by the aforementioned wave of the red flag. Target scoring followed the same principles throughout the era. A bull was worth four points, a center three, and an outer two. Generally speaking, ricochets didn't count during individual firing. However, there were some practices, typically the more dynamic ones, in which ricochets did count. The scoring for the volley and independent firing targets, as well as the myriad of other non-class targetry, varied considerably, sometimes counting three points per hit, and later on, only one. The ammunition used during this era was the standard rolled foil cased 577-450 cartridge, known officially as the cartridge small arm ball breech loading for Martini Henry, 
and went through a total of three different marks. From the mid-1880s, there was a drawn brass version that had been made as a response to the troubles experienced with the existing ammunition in the Sudan, but the two marks of drawn brass cartridge never replaced the older foil variety, which were used throughout the era. Packaged in packets of 10 rounds, and then into barrels, boxes, or cases, depending on the location and type of service, with the barrels becoming obsolete quite early on. The 480 grain paper patched bullet was driven at 1300 feet per second. As we'll see as the series develops, it could be effective at well past 1000 yards. For purposes of any demonstrations found in this series of videos, I've used my own facsimile of this cartridge. There's a three part series on this type of ammunition found on the channel's ammunition playlist. During the Victorian era, musketry training and shooting was undertaken wearing comparatively little equipment and nearly always in some form of undress or working uniform. For the bulk of training, especially as it pertained to preliminary training, drill order was worn. This consisted of the frock, or in guards or highland regiments, the short white shell jacket, the forage cap being the Glengarry in this period, and the waist belt, bayonet, and a single ammunition pouch were worn at the front right. Perhaps unofficially termed musketry order, especially in relation to this training, this was the order of dress worn for the bulk of the shooting, done during the man's annual qualification. There were, of course, some necessary deviations. For certain practices, the helmet or other full-dress headdress was prescribed, along with the valise and greatcoat. Here are some examples. As you can see, typically the full kit and headdress was to be worn for collective practices conducted in close order, often with the addition of fixed bayonets. For collective practices in extended order, the dress was typically the aforementioned drill order. So I hope that this has given a brief understanding of the context within which the soldier of the 1870s and 80s learned and practiced his shooting. Musketry was not simply the demonstration of a skill, but rather the training in and application of small arms fire on the battlefield to achieve a given effect. As we progress through this series, we'll see how the training and subsequent firing on the range translated directly into performance on the battlefield. In the next video, we'll examine the preliminary training undertaken by the men before they fired their weapons with live ammunition on the range. I'd like to thank friend of the channel Neil of the Martini Henry Society and martinihenry.org for the kind use of some of his photographs. Neil's book, entitled The Martini Henry for Queen and Empire, is a must read for any martini enthusiast. There's a full review here on the channel. For all your Snyder or martini reloading needs, talk to Martin at X-Ring Services. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. And for more information on projects and updates between videos, follow us on our Facebook page.